Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sunny in Phoenix podcast, a weekly podcast where we keep you up to date on everything Phoenix Suns basketball. This week, we're giving out some report cards to the front court, and then we're going to be talking about which playoff series that we've been keeping up with, which ones have been most interesting to us. I'm Charlie Erling. We got a full house today. I've got David McGraw and Mitch Krumpetich with me. What's up, guys? Yeah, you know, it's it seems like it's been a really long time since we had all three of us on here. It seems like it, for like the last month we've done them where it's just been two of us. and Maybe it hasn't been the last month, but it seems like it. It's been a long time, and I'm really happy for all of us to be here. I'm so happy. Yeah, it feels feels good to be back. A little emotional. A little emotional. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> Make sure to get a hold of us on social media. Our Twitter is at Sunny and PHX Pod. Our email is Sunny and PHX Pod at gmail.com. And check us out over at our new host, the Deepish Thoughts Podcast Network, over at deepishthoughts.com. Thanks for listening to the Sunny and Phoenix Podcast. If you'd like to further support the show, you can head over to tpublic.com slash user slash sunny in PHX. That's T-E-E public.com slash user slash sunny in PHX. We've got t-shirts, mugs, phone cases, all kinds of stuff. You can get our famous cheese is warming up design or just one that says sunny in PHX. Again, tpublic.com slash user slash sunny in PHX. And go Suns! Okay, last week we gave out grades to the backcourt, so this episode it's time to hand them out to the big men. Let's get right into it, and I'll start things off with our starting small forward, TJ Warren. Warren had a really hot start to the season. He was averaging just about 20 points per game in the early weeks of the season, but then he started to trail off a bit, and then after that head injury that we didn't really even learn much about, uh, he really slowed down during that whole deal. But once he returned, he started a bit slow and then really picked up the pace and was really just playing great ball towards the end of the year. And especially after we traded P.J. Tucker, which put him into the starting spot, which secured that for him, he really stepped things up. And not just the scoring either. It was uh, the rebounding. It was the defense. And... After the break, I think he picked up five triple-doubles. Those were all after the break. And he was averaging 7.7 rebounds per game. So, for a letter grade, I think I got to give TJ a B plus, especially for how well he filled in for PJ. Yeah, you know, I think that a B is a solid grade for him. I, I don't know if I would give it a high B. I think a low B, if... I was putting this for a number wise. Uh, He did outperform, I think, what a lot of people did. And he did play a huge role at the beginning of the season and at the end of the season. Consistency was kind of an issue in that middle part, but the head injury and some other factors, I think, were more of a lead into that. He wasn't, he didn't really play all 82. And I think that's what a lot of us wanted to see from him this year or at least 78 or something like that and he didn't get that but you know this was a healthier season I think for him even with the head injury and uh, I'm excited to see him next year where he probably has full reins to the starting spot for the entire season yeah I agree with all that and uh, I'm gonna go with a B as well I considered going with a B minus because of the inconsistency that David mentioned, but I think a big part of that was the injury, and I can't really hold that against him. So I think a solid B is good, and all he has to do to uh, get that up to an A next year is be more consistent and just play more games. And one last thing about TJ, I think my favorite stat line of his of the season he picked up two technical fouls he talked at the ref like he he got rowdy enough to uh talk at a ref and he picked up a couple technicals and that's not something you expect out of him and something you don't really want to see out of guys a ton but i'm just i'm happy it happened for him i wouldn't say the same for some other guys but tj picking up a technical 
something probably went down enough. If something went down enough for TJ to say something, it, it was deserved. Yeah, I mean, speaking of technicals and how TJ did talk a little bit, we can go on the entire other side of the spectrum for someone that may or may not have talked a little bit too much, especially for his rookie year. We got uh, Marquis Chris next up on the dock. And uh, I, I think I am going to give him a B. I would think to give him just a little bit lower just because it was his rookie year and I felt he was just about average. But towards the end of the season, we were giving him more run and some more minutes. He did have some nice stat lines. And, you know, we pretty early on decided to thrust him into the starting lineup as a rookie. And I think that was good for his development. I think that he was able to build a lot of chemistry and stuff with some of the guys on the bench, especially, um, including Big Sauce, Tyler Eulis, and Derek Jones Jr. But I think specifically looking at just how he was able to work with TJ Warren and Book, I think that will work out a lot better as time progresses, and I'm really excited to see some of that next year as well. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And I'm going to give Chris a B. Um, he showed a lot of tools and skills and potential that could develop very soon. Um, but the foul trouble sets him back a little bit. And just the fact that he's a rookie and is still figuring a lot out uh, puts him at a B, which really is a great grade for for a guy like him. So, yeah, solid B again. You know, I, I'm going to go with the C-plus for Chris. And I guess I I just expected a little more out of him. I'm not complaining about what his numbers were this season. I thought he did, did a pretty solid job. But, I like, he averaged 4.2 rebounds per game this season. He played over 20 minutes per game. I'd like to see a little more rebounding action than that. And then the defensive intensity all the time it seemed like towards the end end of the year he was coming around and he was just blocking shots like a madman I would have liked to see that a little earlier on but maybe that just talks about him only playing basketball for six years of his life and now he's in the big leagues so I, I guess uh C plus you know maybe a B minus let's go B minus B minus for Chris yeah I think that's just about where we all are with him is that like low B I think it could have easily gone to uh, high C and uh, not the drink. Because uh, if it was, wasn't probably for that end of the year stretch, I probably would have had him at a C plus. Yeah, I agree. But uh, speaking of defensive intensity, next up we have Tyson Chandler, who had a great season, actually, for what he played. Uh, he, he only played 47 games. Um, so that makes it kind of hard to evaluate but I'm going to go out on a bit of a limb here and I'm going to give Tyson an A because he averaged 11.5 rebounds per game which is the most since the 14-15 season in Dallas um, and before that to, to get to a number above 10 you have to go back to 07-08 so he had a really good season on the boards and on defense as usual and as a great mentor to our extremely young team and when given the option to leave Phoenix at the trade deadline like PJ Tucker Tyson decided to stay and get paid to sit on the bench and mentor guys but I think it's cool that he decided to stay and uh, be part of our organization so I give Tyson an A yeah I don't know if I want to necessarily say that uh like PJ Tucker because I don't think PJ really wanted to leave either but we sent him off That's um, true. but Tyson Tyson's tough for me I really like Tyson I have for a few years now probably about five six years where I've really tried to follow Tyson and uh, all those and while I think he did everything we asked him to and I think he was fourth in rebounding percentage while he was playing I think something like that I think there was something along those lines that might have dropped like since he like sat out and so there were some other guys that were putting up some good rebounding numbers 
but I think he was like right around fourth in rate or percentage or whatever. So he had a pretty good season rebounding, and we kind of just only asked him to do that. Uh, I I don't want to give him higher than a low B, just because there wasn't a whole lot of contributing. He is slowing down, and all those things. So I want to put him more in the off court as well of things that he did but I'm trying to throw that out the window towards the team because I mean I think he was great as a mentor and all these other things but I'm play wise I think that um you know we didn't ask him to step up and those kind of things I think that just puts him right around a low B right I think I'm going with a B too and I have no gripes about Chandler he's He's a veteran in the league. He played about 28 minutes per game for us. And then on the offensive end, not known for being a big scorer, but he shot 67% from the floor. And even at the free throw line, 73%. That's that's solid stuff for a big guy. And my only complaint is, although he is a great positional defender and he knows his stuff on that end, I'd like to see more than half a block per game out of him. Uh, I mean, you even look over at Len. Len's getting 1.3 per game. So, yeah, th- that's my one my one thing. If you were able to uh, turn some shots the other way a little more often, I'd be giving him a higher grade. But Chandler does his job down there, and I'm, I'm happy he stuck around personally. And uh, keeping with the, the big dogs, we got that big lanky dude, Dragon Bender. And it's it's really tough to really evaluate his season. He it, the NBA looked like it was moving a little too fast for him at the beginning of the year. It took him a while to get his feet wet and just prepared to play in every game. It seemed like, but I mean I I'm still happy with Bender. I think he has a lot of room to improve, and we just really have to be patient with the guy. And just I while I was looking through some stats today, I noticed in the 43 games that he played this season, he only shot 11 free throws. So as a big man, I know we like to space it out with him on the court, but once he gets down in that post or grabs an offensive rebound, I'd love to see him get to the line a little more often than that. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and... Instead of giving him, like, a letter grade, I want to do a different school analogy and just say if if this were school, Dragon Bender would be held back a year. And, like, next year I'm going to consider his rookie season, basically, as long as he's healthy. You know, get a full summer league in and then play a few more games and he'll be adjusted to the pace. So I'm just going to go with hold him back a year. Good call. Youngest guy in the league, maybe he came a year too early, so... Exactly. Give him that pass. How about you, David? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people didn't think he was originally going to even come over this season. Uh, Then there were the talks about his buyout, actually having a buyout every single year in his contract in EuroLeague. So, I think it's fair to say that he was not going to be ready to be a role player this season. And there was going to be times where he was going to be out there just trying to get developed. I think that's why people really thought he would join the D-League because of the fact that, uh, or that he would be part of our D-League team because of the growth and everything. But that didn't happen. We kept him with the group of guys and being a part of that and being a part of the main team trainers and main team coaching. I think if I'm going to give him a grade, you got to give him a C. I mean, he's right around what I thought he would do for this season. Maybe a little bit more, but, you know, he did. He played 40 games, 46, I think, is what you said. 43. 43, whatever. 43, yeah. I knew I was going to be either a couple up or a couple down, but, yeah. So, I think right around a C is fine. I am excited for to excited to see him in Summer League and uh, see how he goes next season, and I'm looking forward to his development. And speaking of very bad transitions about long, lanky, white Europeans, let's talk about Alex Len. And that's what I'm going with for my transition for him. 
Um, <laughs> Alex Len leaves a lot to be desired for all of us, I think. And he's going to be having that new contract coming this season. He will be a restricted free agent unless we don't give him a tender. We will probably give him a tender of some sort, so that way we can match anything that he gets. There was talk about, at the beginning of the season, about what kind of contract he could net. There was talk throughout the entire season about this being his contract year and if he was going to be able to step up and put up those numbers. And Yeah, no, like, it didn't really happen. So, he, he did have 1.3 blocks, which I think was 19th altogether in the NBA is what I looked at the other day. And... 13th among centers because they're guys like Kevin Durant and Matinta Kumpo and a couple power forwards on that list. So right around 13th for centers. So I think that's about average for blocks. But uh, the, the fact that he got 1.3 blocks kind of shocked me because it seemed like he just got punished a lot in the post. So I, I will give him a little bit of credit for that. But everything else was kind of lacking for me this year for him. I felt like he needed to do more in his contract year to justify giving him a big payday, and I I just don't see it for that. I if we can if we can get him back on a cheap bargain deal of some sort, I'd be happy. If not, I I don't really want to overpay him, even though we don't have another center on the roster besides Chandler when it comes to him. So I I'm gonna give him a C if. A low C is what I'll say. C minus, whatever. And uh, leave it at that. Yeah, you know, I think I'll give him the C minus too. And, you know, when you look at his stats, they're not as bad as what you would expect them to be from having watched Alex Len play how many games? 77 games this season. And then if you uh, throw that into per 30 per 36 minutes that's 14 points per game almost 12 rebounds and over two blocks so that that confuses me a little bit would alex len actually put up those numbers if he played 36 minutes probably not but that's what those numbers say so i'm i'm really wishy-washy on len right now if we can if we can bring him back without paying any absurd amount of money I, I mean, I think he's worth a chance, I guess. So, yeah, I'm going C-. minus. So I want to make an analogy to explain how I think this season went for Alex Len. This was his fourth year with the team, so I would compare his NBA career to undergraduate studies in college. This would be his senior year. So, like, his freshman year, he was super excited, first year, trying really hard, doing really well. Um, second year, pretty good. Third year, pretty good. The fourth year, he had some senioritis this year, I think. You know, ready to move on, ready to, to do some new things. And if we don't end up re-signing him, it'll be like he's going to a grad school where, you know, he had this kind of C's, D's, get degrees mentality in Phoenix this year and he can go somewhere else and be like yeah I did what I needed to to get paid somewhere else or go to grad school somewhere else and be a role player so uh that's that's how I kind of feel about Len's season he wasn't like horrible but it wasn't anything to write home about so um I think C- minus is pretty good that was a really long analogy and I was wondering where it was going <laughs> And at first I was like, are you trying to say that this is like his senior year at college and like development wise or like what? But I got it and uh, I'll give you a thumbs up on that, Mitch. I dig it. Nice. Thanks. <laughs> so, you know, my one thing with Len is my reason for wanting to bring him back is what if he gets signed by a team in the West and he turns into a beast? We still don't know that that can't happen. The, the Miles Plumley effect, right? Yeah, exactly. Miles, Sky Miles, <laughs> Plum Dog Millionaire. I mean... That, that's what Alex Lund's going to be. That was definitely a joke, too. <laughs> I, I was hoping. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, technically, you got paid, like, technically. I, I guess I just, if we lose Alex Len, I want it to be to a team in the East. I think that'd be a fair thing to say. And 
saying that, that means that I kind of want to keep him around just to see what will happen. I, I wouldn't mind keeping him for another year just to see. I also totally wouldn't be against but. someone in our conference – or either division or conference paying him way too much money and him being strung up in their cap for a while and being just a role player. So they can all get a taste of what we had with Brandon Knight this year? Yeah, pretty much. You want that to <laughs> yeah, happen? Exactly. Or even what we had with Alex <laughs> Len this year. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Uh, yeah. All right, uh, let's move it on. Mitch, what do you think about duds jared dudley yeah so jared dudley fan favorite jmz back in the valley i think we're all happy about it um he played 64 games this year uh had a little bit of time off we weren't really sure if we'd see him back or not but we did um he averaged 6.8 points uh 3.5 rebounds and 1.9 assists in 21.3 minutes per game which those numbers don't look very good but like his hustle was really good uh let's take a look here his three point percentage was 37.9 percent which is actually his lowest in like four years Hmm. but uh i mean he i think he had a good season i want to give him like a high b just because he was out there hustling every night, and I was just happy to have him back. Yeah, um, the only reason I don't give Dudley, I think, a B is because I think he did exactly what he's done for the last... How many years has Jared Dudley been in the league? At least since, like, yeah, at least since, like, 2009 or whatever, that... He's basically doing the exact same thing that he has done, which is be a energy guy, hit threes, hustle, those kind of things. And energy guy is kind of wrong, but energy guy off the benches and energy gives everyone else kind of a bit of energy. So, no, that's right. Anyways, um, for that, I'm just I'm going to give him a high C or C plus or whatever, just because I think that Nothing really changed with his game. I don't think he really elevated his game. I think he did about what we would have expected from him at the beginning of the season. And I don't want to let off-court or any of those kind of things of how he was with the young guys influence his uh, on-court play and grading him. You also have to remember, sorry, that uh, he, he got into a couple fights this year too as our enforcer does that does that change just that reminder does that change your opinion okay he had didn't he only have one fight no it's with jason smith isn't that that dude's name on washington i thought he had more than one uh that boosts him from a 77 to a 79 all right so you said the smith the little smith tussle pushed him up a little bit and that's what happened to my vote too it went from a B to a B plus, though. I, I like. I am giving Dudley a little more love than you did, and I guess I'm going for a lot of the off court stuff and all the knowledge. I hope that he's imparting onto Dragon Bender and even Marquise Chris, just all the young guys on the team. He's just so good to have there. So, but man, I just love how he took care of Ulysses and give gave uh, Jason Smith the headbutt, and then. He got, he got fined as much as Brandon Jennings did for doing the finger guns. I was like, you got to let Dudley go on that. <laughs> <laughs> the finger gun. Get out of here, Brandon Jennings. All right. But uh, let's let's move it on. Let's talk about Big Sauce. Big Sauce Allen Williams, as we like to call him here, the, the full title. And if you're a Suns fan, you watch Suns games, you notice that Allen, Allen Williams is having a good time out there. And I think that's really contagious for the team, and, and that's something that is impressive in its own. But then you look at the guy's number, he shoots over 51% from the floor. Uh, the free throw numbers were down a bit, 62%. But then uh, 7.5 points, 6.2 rebounds. He, he got 15 triple doubles this year in his 47 games, games played in 15.1 minutes per game. And then 
like Big Sauce is the man of the check out my per 36 numbers. 17.6 points per game and just under 15 rebounds per game. You know, <laughs> you know the guy's doing work and I, I that's what I love him for and you you can't expect anything out of Allen Williams. His story about how he made it to the NBA, you can't expect much out of the guy. But then he goes and does this every night. It's just hard to explain. I'm going for going with an A for Allen Williams. Yeah, I'm actually going to go with an A+, plus because Allen Williams, like, we love him, but he should not be in the NBA. <laughs> and last year, all Allen Williams was was the guy who celebrated the most on the bench. And we said, I remember this time last year, we were like, hopefully we keep him just to watch more celebrations on the bench. And he came in and actually played well and had double-doubles and stuff. <laughs> so, A-plus for Big Sauce. Yeah. When he went in in that last game against Sacramento last year and got a double double, he hadn't really played minutes at all the entire season. He'd been in like, he'd been on the Suns for like nine games, and I think played like a total of fifteen minutes or something dumb like that. Like, just didn't play at all. Had that double double against Sacramento. It was awesome. I, I mean, like, if I could give him over a one hundred percent, I would just because I love the dude and I. I know that's like we're super biased about Alan Williams. Like, there's no doubt about it. So, whatever. I don't care. I love the dude, and I want him back in the valley for as long as possible. Cause that work ethic and that bench presence of even just everyone getting hyped up about him <laughs> and him getting hyped up about everyone just kind of adds to it. And it it it's super valuable I think plus you can't I mean like you said the per 36 numbers and like just really the effort he puts out there as being a dude that's like 6'8 or like like you you can't you have to like put that into perspective too of being like alright this is dude's a 6'8 dude this is gonna go out there and do dirty work I love it over 100% for Alan Williams yeah so, and also I think next year Big Sauce should be the first participant in the three-point contest skills challenge and dunk contest i think that would really help all-star so, just to uh, get the crowd let's get that just going. get the crowd hyped can yeah. he, make it just can he dunk? make it great again can now yes he can yeah, dunk. exactly <laughs> big sauce can dunk get out of here has, i'm of just asking like has dunk. he ever dunked in a game yeah definitely okay not a lot. But I, it's I, I swear, every single time it's a lane. There's no like, not like ever a dunk. He doesn't like to show off. He's humble. <laughs> <laughs> That's why his name's Big Sauce. So, what what do we think? Is there a chance that we get to see Big Sauce at summer league again this year? I mean, it, I oh, really he's got to so. be there, right? <laughs> And you know he's he's not a bona fide NBA player yet. He still needs to, uh, like, he needs to be auditioning for the future every chance he gets. Still, because who knows if he's going to get the minutes he did this year on the team next year. So, man, I hope he's there. And we need to get we need to find him, and we need to get him on the podcast over summer league. That's like that's our that's yes. our new goal. <laughs> that's what we're going to strive for. <laughs> I feel like we that don't was care about how many people too. listen to the show. We, we don't care about uh, that wait, stuff. Well, actually, well, no, we really don't. We we just want to uh, well, we want to okay. interview Big Some Sauce and have him on the podcast. That's it. <laughs> I, I'm down. I, I think that's a good goal. Speaking of guys that uh, are was ba speaking of guys that a guy that was a D League player um, really worked his butt off to get to where he was and probably. Wouldn't have been given a chance in the NBA, but should have anyways. Derek Jones Jr. Um, you know, kind of the last participant. Wait, no, not participant. Kind of the last guy on the bench, or last guy on the roster for a lot of the year in general, but really started getting a chance, right? I, I mean, like, I, I want to say chance in the NBA, like, right after the 20, right after the start of the new year. And um, really after some really good highlight dunks in the D-League. And that athleticism was awesome. And 
It took him a while to actually get his first dunk in the NBA. I believe it was against the Lakers right before the All-Star break. He had two. But you always saw the athleticism. And, you know, he was my favorite part of the dunk contest, even though the dunk contest was pretty lacking. And duh, there's bias there. Don't call me out on it. But I think for Derek Jones Jr., did anyone really expect anything from him except for to be an end-of-the-bench guy? He had some good dunks this year, had a lot of hops. I think that gives him a B at least. So, I mean, just for the chance of you didn't expect anything from him. He kind of came out of nowhere. He was a D-league guy that we just decided to start giving minutes when we started having the injury stuff and not a whole lot of spots on the bench open. So... Really got to give a shout out to Derek Jones Jr. for what he was able to do this season. And him and Marquise Chris starting to get a little bit of a rep for just the athleticism for us young sons. So you got to love that and give him some ups for that. For him being mentioned with the number eight overall pick as part of our young super athletic core. And that's kind of nice. Yeah, I mean... The D League is full of guys who are like super athletic and can't do anything else. And I kind of thought Derek Jones Jr. was going to be one of those guys. But we saw him do some pretty exciting things, like the game we went to against the Thunder specifically. He was he had to guard Russell Westbrook for a lot of the game, and he got into Westbrook's head and really got him out of a groove. I mean, Westbrook still put up like 49 points or something like that, but the Thunder lost, and... Westbrook was super frustrated with Jones Jr., who's a D-League guy, basically. So I was just really happy to see him do those kind of things, along with the dunks, of course. So I, I have to go with an A for Jones Jr. Yeah, you know, really towards the end of the season there, I had less expectations for Jones Jr. than I did for Big Sauce. So I gave Big Sauce the A. Jones Jr. gets the A, too. And I'm really excited if we can keep him around about his potential as as a defender and then as a rebounder too I mean the guy can fly so why not grab some rebounds while you're up there too I I, I think he could really be a great role player towards the end of that bench but if he grows I mean he can he might be a guy that can earn some minutes in the in like a playoff rotation who knows he could be that lockdown defender so I'm giving him the A. I'm excited for him. And I mean, who goes from a no name into the dunk contest and then actually getting minutes on your team to starting? How many games did he start? He started eight games this year. So really glad for him, I guess. Yeah, I completely almost forgot to even think about the points where we just told him to guard the best the point guard on the opposing team just because... Uh, it, it was totally a ploy to get the point guard to just attack him and not focus on anyone else. Because they were like, oh, you know, whatever. But it worked, and I think that's a big part of, you know, that Thunder win. Um, a couple other of the close games of just having him be in there. and It may not have been pretty, and it may not have been whatever, but uh, props to him for just being like, all right, coach, ask me to do this. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it as best I can. And, not backing down right and being six foot eight with uh long limbs and a freakish vertical you can afford to get beat a little bit on the defensive end and make up for it which we saw happen those blocks from behind i mean great stuff excited for him but anyways let's uh that, that pretty much nails everybody in the front court this season and let's move on talk about the playoffs a bit and let's keep things simple here mitch which series have you been enjoying the most so far? So I'm going to pick the series I've been able to watch the most. I mean, it's a good series, but it's Thunder Rockets. It's been a fun series. I've watched more of those games than the other uh, series, and it's cool to see Westbrook versus Harden and see guys like Trevor Ariza and Eric Gordon continue to play well. Uh, and Ryan Anderson, those guys who are usually hurt, it's cool to see them playing well right now. And then for the Thunder, I mean, 
we're seeing such a historic season from Westbrook, so it's pretty cool to see that. Uh, Sabonis, of course. Uh, Cantor and Adams, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Has Sabonis even played at all? Not very much. Uh, I was going to say, like... Yeah, but, I mean, still, it's. I think it's a great matchup. I think it's one of the... I guess I don't want to say more even matchups, but, like... It's it's just an exciting matchup full of intensity and I think Harden and Westbrook are two of the most passionate players. So seeing those two go head to head in every one of these games is just great to see from like a neutral basketball fan standpoint. So that's the series I've been enjoying. Um my runner up though is Milwaukee Toronto because that's pretty interesting and we get our regular uh, playoff Raptors where they fall apart. And Milwaukee hasn't been in the playoffs in, like, forever. I just haven't been able to watch that series very much. Yeah, you know, um, in Milwaukee, they were in two years ago the um, when we traded for Brandon oh, yeah, Knight. that's right. Uh, they still made the playoffs. But uh, them back in the playoffs has been really cool. And I do appreciate that you didn't say that the Thunder Rockets was necessarily – the most even matchup because I mean like it has been there were two games where it was close but I still feel like that there's an obvious better team there and um, yeah definitely yeah and it really shows some of the offensive deficiencies of the Thunder in general um I don't really like any of the series right now in the playoffs and I don't know why the Spurs and Memphis were boring up until... I mean, they're still pretty boring, except for the fact that Memphis blew them out the last game. Does that mean Memphis is going to win the series? No. But everyone keeps on talking about... What was it? I was listening to the the NBA show, the Bill Simmons, his network or whatever, for the first time in forever, and I had to listen to Chris Mannix talk about how the Spurs are a legit contender and all these other things. This whole thing about there actually being another contender besides Golden State in the West just completely is really dumb in my book. I mean, like, I, I just don't see it. I don't see it at all. And I know that Kevin Durant, like, is not 100%, and so he hasn't been playing, but that isn't really stopping the Warriors from being really good which is just dumb and ridiculous that they have lower depth, but they're still able to play really well. I think if there is a team in the West that could beat them, I think the Rockets could trade shot for shot with them. But, you know, that's it's going to be tough, and the Rockets would have to be able to be going at 120%. Uh, Blazers and six, by the way. <laughs> Blazers and six. If I'm going to talk about any other series, I mean... Pacers are just melting down, and it's not Paul George's fault. And the rest of his team sucks, and that's probably going to push Paul and, George. And away. he'll let you know that. And he will and let, let you. Know I that. don't blame him. <laughs> uh, Larry Bird is very questionable um, as a front office executive. I mean, they had Frank Vogel. Frank Vogel was able to push a team without Paul George into almost the playoffs or the playoffs, whatever. And then Frank Vogel gets fired a year later. They bring in Al Jefferson and Jeff Teague. They trade away what was Torin Prince, which, I mean, Torin Prince has been doing well for the Hawks, but maybe that's just the Hawks, but I feel like if Frank Vogel was there and they would have just kept Torin Prince and George Hill, then it would have been fine. Or, no, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, that is what I was thinking. They, they traded the Jazz pick for, basically, yeah. So if they would have not, if they would have either kept just George Hill, who Paul George was really tight with, and, or they would have kept the pick, then they wouldn't have had to have Jeff Teague. And Jeff Teague is... I, I just... I don't know what they were thinking with that. Thad Young, I at least understood. They didn't really give up much for Thad Young. And, you know, Miles Turner is good, but... I mean, I, I don't know. Just that... I don't, I don't blame Paul George as much for that. And, I mean, the Cavs are, have LeBron, so... It's just another thing of Paul George coming up short. I think if, like, there is one series that I'm actually excited about, it was the Bulls-Celtics, but then Rondo got hurt, and now he might not even be back for the playoffs. So that makes it a little less interesting and fun. So there's and that. And, you know, like, 
Like, I'm no doctor here, but Rondo hurt his thumb, and he has a cast like all the way up to his elbow. Is that is that weird <laughs> or so? Like, I think uh, if I'm remembering my rudimentary anatomy from my senior year of high school, like basically, like depending on where he broke his thumb, like any wrist movement, like at all, could like jack up his thumb even worse okay that makes and sense. so like that's why like half the time with like wrist injuries and stuff you have to have it go so far up your arm because you can't like have your wrist or like that part of your arm move at all because like it can just jack it up even more and depending on where that thumb injury was like i think that any movement of the wrist could have happened but i mean like supposedly he got it in the third quarter when he was doing like trying to block kelly olenic or something or get the ball away from kelly olenic and then there was a story about how when rondo originally tore his acl he thought he just pulled a hamstring and played an entire game on it so i mean apparently he just is not much for the pain department so so his his thumb is probably shattered (laughs) into like a million pieces they did just say like, oh, i think i might have sprained this they did say it was just a fracture it's just like flopping around it is just a fracture it's not a compound fracture so normally that just means there's just a solid break a single All one right. though would, would you prefer it to be a fracture or like a floppy uh thumb you know, like I think if you're trying to see if a thumb's like going to be floppy real, or not, real floppy, that you've got to hope that it's not a compound. I think a compound fracture will give you a floppy thumb before a single fracture will, for sure. You know what? I'm just going to jump in here and change the subject a little bit. <laughs> Plus, I just want to talk a little bit. We didn't say this, but, I mean, we got to give points to the Grizzlies Spurs series just for the take that for data rant. We, we haven't seen anything like that in a little while. You know, it's just been a bit since we've been graced with a, a line that strong that resonates so well. That was just great. I loved that. But I, I don't care much for the Spurs or the Grizzlies. So otherwise, I, I just really don't care who wins that. But the one I'm interested in is definitely the uh, Clippers at Jazz Clippers and Jazz series because it's just been such a mess and I'm kind of enjoying it. I don't like seeing guys get injured, but just the the effects that it has on the team can be uh, entertaining, I guess. So the Jazz lost Rudy right in the first possession of the game and now Blake hurt his toe. He's out for how long? I don't even know. The playoffs. It, the playoffs, he's yeah, out for he's, the rest of the baby. He, Holy cow. They, they have no they said that like he's not going to come back for the playoffs at all. Okay, yeah, so that that's insane. And then the Clippers' overall bad luck as a NBA basketball franchise, like, we, we all know about that. That's just, it's still there. It's present. And we're witnessing it strong this year. So I, I'm really pulling for the Jazz to win that. I'd be very satisfied if that's how that one went down. Yeah, the only reason that, I mean, like, I know, I think last week I said I didn't want to count out playoff Blake Griffin. But... Then I started kind of remembering that when one of Blake Griffin or Chris Paul is out, that all of a sudden the Clippers play like pretty decently, and mostly it's when Blake Griffin's out. They play all right, and maybe they should have traded him before he got hurt again, because he gets hurt a lot, and gotten either a three or a four that could help space out the floor a little bit better. But, uh, I mean, I think they started... Luke Bob Ute and Paul Pierce or something like that. Those are three and four. And so I think the spacing that like DeAndre has is ridiculous. And you know, he's with Rudy Gobert out, he's got a very favorable matchup against Derek Favors and anyone else. And if you're watching those games, you can see just that he is having no issues whatsoever doing whatever he wants. And that that's got that's you got to be scary. That's got to be scary if you're rooting for the Jazz. All right. Well, I think we need to uh, end the show the way we normally do, and that's with some non-sports plugs. It's time for David's comic book corner, Mitch's face melting minute, and I will make something up in between. David, you're up. 
Yeah, you know, um, I, I, it was tough trying to actually come up with a plug this week because the last couple of weeks, really, I have been in the throes of playing way too many video games and not really doing a whole bunch of reading. And that continued this week, so I'm kind of just going to plug what I've been doing for the last, for about 20 hours this week, is play Persona 5, which you guys have no idea what that is, but it's a PlayStation game that is a Japanese role-playing game that is manga-styled, kind of, and anime-styled, and it's a turn-based RPG. It's a lot of fun. It's kind of Pokemon-esque for adults, if that kind of is whatever. That's kind of basically what it is. It's ridiculous. It's very Japanese. It is very turn-based. It's a lot of fun. I got it on Wednesday or Thursday, and I've dropped 20 hours into it. It's Saturday right now, and I've put way too much time into it, and that's what I've been doing, and it's really cutting into my Overwatch time, but it's a good thing to cut into my Overwatch time, so... <laughs> right on. So, you know, I guess the thing that's been sticking with me over the last uh, week or so since we've been... Yeah, we've skipped a few of these non-sports plugs, but I've been going to my nephew's baseball games lately. He's just a he's just a kid. It's like coach pitch league, but man, that brings you back. If you go to a little league baseball field and you see all those and you played baseball when you were a kid and you just watch those kids, it's so like I just remember like the little things from back then about like there's this one kid he like smashed a bug. And then he picked it up and he was showing all the other kids in the dugout and it was just hilarious. And like, I was like, yeah, I used to do stupid stuff like that. I don't know. I just, I just like watching baseball when it comes to situations like that. So looking forward to uh, getting into a little baseball now that uh, basketball is winding down. Yeah. I'm not a big baseball fan, but I actually coached little league for two years. I think I was an <laughs> assistant coach and uh, you know, I hate baseball really, but going to games and like doing stuff with Little League is tons of fun. And uh, I have seen a couple of those pictures with uh, Uncle Chuck, and it's uh, it's very <laughs> cute stuff. That's what's up. Oh, and maybe next week I'll tell the story about how I got an opposing coach thrown out of a Little League baseball game <laughs> a few years ago. That's a good one. Ooh, that's yeah, a good one. That's some good stuff. That's spicy. <laughs> Um, I've also been watching quite a bit of baseball, actually. So, uh, yeah, go baseball. But the album I'm going to plug this week is one that I have listened to like a million times, but I kind of forgot about for a while. And it's Ascendancy by Trivium. It came out in 2005. Trivium's super cool, very technical, uh, very music theory heavy. They're great guitar players. My favorite songs on the album are Rain, Pull harder on the strings of your martyr, ascendancy, a gun, a gunshot to the head of trepidation, and dying in your arms. So check that out, Ascendancy by Trivium. All right, good stuff. That's going to do it for this week. Be sure to check us out on social media. Our Twitter is at Sunny in PHX Pod, and hit us up with an email over at Sunny in PHX Pod at gmail.com. Be sure to tune in next week and go Suns.